you say be still, then I will wait. If you say to trust, I will obey. I don't want to follow my own ways. I'm done chasing feelings. Spirit, lead me. Oh, Spirit, lead me. Let's go. It felt like a bird.
when you say to jump, I'm diving in. If you say be still, then I will wait. And if you say to trust, I will obey. You're the only truth, the life, the way. I'm done chasing feelings. Go open your Bibles, if you would please, to Ephesians chapter 6. You know, we are, we started a series a few weeks ago on have you been weaponized by the Jesus? Amen. The first thing he does is he arrests your attention and then he comes into your life and he brings his power and his love and he radicalizes you. Amen. Just like you did the Apostle Paul. You can become radicalized by the Lord Jesus, but then before he sends you out into this world, he wants to weaponize you. So you are an effective weapon in his kingdom against his adversary and our adversary, the devil. So we started uh, a few weeks ago, and we went to this uh, foundational scripture, if I can turn my thing on and get it going here. All right. This is Paul writing to Timothy. And he's writing these verses about warfare because whether you know it or not, when you said, Jesus, come into my life, forgive me of my sins and be the Lord of my life, you entered into a spiritual warfare. You became a part of the greatest army this universe has ever known. It's the army of God. You became a soldier of Jesus Christ. Whether you're male or whether you're female, you're a soldier. And so Paul, writing to Timothy, a young pastor, he's trying to remind him, Timothy's going through some hard times. And you and I are both going to go through hard times in our life. I don't care if you're a Christian. I don't care if you're not a Christian. You're going to face difficult times. The difference is we as Christians, thank God, we've been weaponized by God. Amen. Against our adversary, the devil. And so he says, therefore, Christian man, Christian woman, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one who wars entangles himself with the affairs of this life. Now watch this next phrasing, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Now, in some ways, marriage is like that, isn't it, you newlyweds? You want to please each other. You want to live in a way that honors each other, that pleases each other. Why? Because you're in love. Can I get an amen there? So, in Ephesians chapter 6, and hopefully you've turned there, we're going to pick it up with verse 10. 
And I'm going to read it to you out of the complete Jewish Bible. I just like the way it reads. And King James says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. But the complete Jewish Bible brings that into a little more focus. And it says, finally, brethren, grow powerful in union with the Lord, in union with his mighty strength. And that's how you get strong in the Lord and the power of his might is through your union with him. It's not going to happen through your association by just joining a church or being water baptized. Those things are important, yes, and they're necessary. And God set up the local church for us, amen, to be the body of Christ, to encourage one another and to, to speak into one another's lives and to warn one another if we have to. But your strength, your spiritual strength is primarily going to come through your union with Jesus Christ in your worshiping of him, not just here on a Sunday morning, your worshiping of him in your private life, you're praying with him, not just here on Tuesday nights, but in your private life, you're getting to know him. He's already knows you and he loves you and he wants a deeper relationship with you. His door is always open. And his invitation is always there. You and I get strong in the Lord and in the power of his might by becoming more deeply acquainted with him. This is not religion. This is a relationship. Jesus hates religion. He didn't come to establish a religion. He came to establish a relationship with us, his creatures. Amen. And I love that. I love it that he yearns for a relationship with me more than I yearn for a relationship with him. Isn't that crazy? And so he says, you're going to get strong in your union with him. The reason there are so many weak Christians is because they don't spend time with the Lord in private prayer, in their devotion, and in private worship. We're also going to be strong in the Lord by getting to know him through his word. Amen. This word from Genesis to Revelation is the story of man's redemption and the central figure is Jesus Christ. Jesus is in every book of the Old Testament. He's in every book of the New Testament. Amen. He is throughout that and you will come in union with him and get to know him more and more as you read his word. T.L. Osborne, uh, he and his wife, Daisy Osborne, they're in heaven now, passed away a long time ago, or a few years ago, rather. T.L. Osborne, I believe, was one, was a true modern day apostle. Now, Paul the apostle said there are three qualifications of being an apostle. He said, number one, you had to see Jesus. You've had to see him. How many of you know Paul never saw Jesus when Jesus walked on this earth? But Jesus appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus and, of course, appeared to him many times after that. So, number one, you have to see Jesus. Number two, you have to plant churches. And that's exactly what the Apostle Paul did. And T.L. Osborne had been in over 130-some countries of the world establishing churches. And uh, number three, you had to have the signs of an apostle. Miracles and wonders, not just a little bit here and there, but just continuously, and he did. But, and I'm telling you all this uh, for a reason. Let me, let, me, let me go on. Hold your finger right there. The Bible tells you, put on the full armor of God, Christian, you and me. Use all the armor and weaponry that God provides so that you'll be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary, against the wiles of the devil, is what the King James says. He's a strategist, and he is in no hurry. And he knows, he watches you. And he sees what your weaknesses are. He knows how to push your buttons. And he knows if he can't get you through drugs or through alcohol or illicit sex, he'll try to get you through pride. He'll try to get you through riches. He'll try to get you through these hobbies that though sinful not in itself, they suck your time away from Christ. He knows how to do that. So we got to be aware. The connotation is if I don't put on God's armor, I won't be able to stand in the day of testing. I won't be able to stand in the day of adversity. So I need to put on God's armor. And that's what we've been doing. He said, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, human beings, but we wrestle against the devil and his demons. How many know that? Now we're going to contend with men and women. We're going to debate with them. Uh, we may even argue with them. There may be people that God wants you to cut them out of your life because they are a bad uh, uh, influence on you. So we will contend with people, but behind all those people, we know there's an adversary who 
is igniting them, who's speaking to them, who is pushing them further and further into darkness and into their conflict with us. So how many know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood? No, no, I'm going to go over their head and I'm going to go straight to Jesus, amen, with his name and I'm going to fight the enemy. So we don't do that. Then he said this, so take up every piece of war equipment. I love that language that God provides so that when the evil day comes, when's the evil day? That's the day you're attacked. That's the day adversity hits. That's the day trouble comes. That's the day persecution arrives. That's the evil day. And he's telling you, take it up even before that day comes. So when it comes, you're able to stand. Too many Christians, they neglect the reading of God's word. They neglect prayer. They neglect devotion. They neglect it until a time of crisis. And then they try to build their house in the flood. Now it can be done, but it's very hard to build a house in a flood. So he's telling you before that ever gets there, fall in love with Jesus, fall in love with his, in, with his word. It's all about Jesus. He's madly in love with you. He wants to associate with you. He wants to commune with you. Amen. His door is never shut. We're the ones that shut doors in our heart and tell Jesus there's certain compartments I don't want you in. No, just open them up and let him come in. Put on this armor so you will be able to stand. Somebody say stand and resist when the battle. And so when the battle is won, you'll still be the one standing. Stand therefore, hold your ground. And that was the first piece of the armor we talked about, having your loins girt about with truth. Now, you and I, we may say, no, the first piece of the armor should be uh, the sword. The first piece of the armor should be the helmet. The first piece of the armor should be the 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 breastplate. But God knows what he's talking about. And God says, look, your first piece of the armor is I want you to gird yourself. I want you to tighten the belt of truth in your life. This is truth. Jesus is truth. His word is truth. God's saying what? I want you to get to know truth. I want you to get to know my son personally. I want you to get to know his word intimately. And in doing so, you are girding yourself with truth. So when the enemy comes, when the lie comes, when the deceptions come, you recognize it. You say, no, that's not true. This is true. When culture comes and says, hey, this is what we are going to promote. This is what we're after. You can go back to the word and you can say, hmm, I don't see that in the word. This is truth. That is a lie. And you're going to stand up with the truth. Of course, you're going to be persecuted for that. You're going to be maligned. You're going to be uh, uh, called all kinds of foul names because you've chosen to stand with the truth. And that's so important. There's many Christians. They don't have the ability belt of truth tighten around their waist. And so they fall prey to heresies. They fall prey to culture. They fall prey to false teaching because they don't have it tightened. And listen, if you, there, there are many false teachers in the world today. Paul and Peter both wrote that in their first century AD, there were many. If there were many then, there are more so now. And they look good and they sound good and, and everything else. But what they teach is not the truth. But you'll never know that unless you get acquainted with the truth. So I'm urging you, get acquainted with the truth. And the reason I, I told you about T.L. Osborne is he and his wife, Daisy, when they were like 19 and 20 years old, were married and they went to India as missionaries. Okay, this is back in the early 50s. They went as missionaries. Now, even though they were Pentecostal people, they did not have the revelation of God doing miracles to prove himself to people. They did not have, though they believed God healed, they did not have the revelation that God would actually use them to pray for people and those people be healed so God could demonstrate to that person that he's real. They didn't have that. They went to India. They had the word of God. They were ill-equipped. This is his own words. We were ill-prepared. They ran into the Muslim people. The Muslim people had their book. The Muslim people said, this is God's word. And T.L. said, no, this is God's word. And they went back and forth. No, this is God's word. He said, no, this is God's word. He said they were both black books with gold pages embossed. He said, I couldn't prove that the God of my book was any better than the God of their book, that the God of my book was the true God. Amen. He said, you know what we did? He said, we went home. He said, I said, told the Lord, I'm embarrassing me and you too. He said, I've met a lot of missionaries that ought to go home because they're an embarrassment. 
He said, so they went home to, to uh, Oregon. He said they were broken in spirit, broken in finances, and broken in health. How many know God loves to use broken things? You see, until you're really broken, you will not be used very greatly of God. Oh yeah, you'll be used here and there. I love the story. T.D. Jakes preaches a great message on communion. And he said how Jesus, he took the bread, he, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. That's what he does with people. He takes you out of the world. He blesses you. But then he must break you, and then he gives you back. So here they were, broken. Spirit, body, finances, broken. They didn't know what to do. They had a church. They came and pastored a church. Their organization, denomination, gave them a church, Pentecostal denomination. And they began to seek the Lord because they were frustrated. One morning, T.L. Osborne was in his study and he was on, his, on, on the floor, on his back, worshiping, and Jesus appeared to him. Now, you can't make that happen. He said, Jesus appeared to me just like I saw him, just like I see you. He said, water began to flow out of my eyes. He said, but I wasn't crying. And he said, I couldn't move a muscle. The awesomeness of his presence just paralyzed you. Now I can take that because I remember John in the book of Revelation when he turned and saw Jesus, his first reaction was he fell on his face as a dead man. And so Brother Osborne said, Jesus appeared to him. He goes, I can't describe it. It was, I saw Jesus. He said, then a man came to town, and some of you uh, more experienced Christians will remember this name. That means older Christians. He said his name was William Branham. William Branham uh, uh, came to town. William Branham was a man so in touch with God, when he would preach, he would just preach calmly. When he would pray for the sick, he would line them up, no screaming, no yelling. He would just say, be healed in the name of Jesus or come to a, a, a man full of devils in the name of Jesus. I cast you out in Jesus' name. He said, we saw that. We heard the preaching of the word. We saw the, the, the miracles, many, many, many miracles that night. And he said, we had our second vision of Jesus. We saw Jesus at work through that man. Okay, first vision, Jesus appeared. Second, I saw him at work through that man. He said, being so moved and encouraged by that, we went home and he said, and my wife Daisy and I made an agreement that we were gonna read the gospels as though we had never read them in our lives, as though this was the first time. And he said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he said, everything that Jesus said he would do, we were gonna underline that and we were gonna believe him to do it. And he said, everything that Jesus said we could do, we were gonna underline that and believe God that we could do it in Jesus. He said, we had our third vision of Jesus. Now get this one. We saw Jesus in his word. And then he stopped to say, and that my friend is the most surest vision you will ever get of Jesus to see him in his word. He said, all the other stuff may be a little haywire. This one will stand the test. Do you see Jesus in his word? Do you see his attributes and his character and his power and his compassion? Do you see his authority when you read his word? He said, having done that, he said, and being so encouraged, we, we set up a meeting of our own in our own hometown and we advertised it. He said, and the day came. He said, I preached the word simple, just like I'd saw that man do. Then after the preaching of the word, we asked the sick and, and those tormented to come forward, and they did. He said, we begin to lay hands on them and pray for them in the name of Jesus Christ, and many of them got healed, many got delivered, and we had our fourth vi vision of Jesus. We saw Jesus at work in us. Wow. Now that's for every believer, except the first one. You can't make Jesus appear to you. But you can see Jesus in his, in his word. 
You can see Jesus at work through men and women, through acts of compassion, through miracles, through acts of service. Then you can see Jesus in his word. You can see him at work in you. Isn't that good? And it all starts with having your loins girt about with truth. Seek Jesus in his word. Too many charismatics, man, they're seeking a word from a prophet. They're seeking a vision. They're seeking a dream. This, Peter said, is a more sure word of prophecy. This will never fail. Why are we going after the other stuff when we have the most surest word of prophecy in our laps? Get to know Jesus through his word. I said first service, my wife was sitting here. We'll be married 47 years uh, coming up this August. Yeah, 47. Now, what kind of a marriage would we have if she still lived in western Nebraska and I lived here, and once every three months, we would talk on the phone? And yet, that's the relationship many Christians have with their Lord. You'll never get to know Jesus that way. You'll never get to know his heart that way. You'll never see a great move of God in your life with that kind of relationship. But the ball is in my court and your court. Jesus' door is open. His invitation is given every day. Do we take it or do we leave it? So he said, Gird, having your loins girt about with truth. I got to get on with this thing. That was the first piece of the armor. And then he said, oh, this is about standing. We know about this. The verses 11 to 13, the word stand means one who, who in the midst of a fight holds his position, persists, continues, perseveres. The other stand in verse 14 means to stand ready or prepared. Preparation versus action. We need them both. Can you say amen? amen. So then the next piece, well, for the believer, he, the gird up your loins is a call for mental and spiritual preparation. Then he says in Ephesians, same verse, 14, after having girt your loins about with truth, he says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate covers the heart and covers the lungs covers vital organs in our body. I mean, you can't breathe without your lungs. You can't live without that heartbeat. And so that breastplate of righteousness, righteousness in its simple form is right standing with God. Now, I love the Bible that it interprets itself. And I love that. That way, we human beings, we don't have to try to come up with something. So Paul, writing about this same breastplate in 1 Thessalonians 5, he doesn't call it the breastplate of righteousness. What does he call it? He said, let us who are of the day be sober. That word sober doesn't just mean not intoxicated with, with wine or alcohol. It means don't let anything intoxicate you away from your love and your devotion for Jesus. Not your spouse. I just had a newborn, uh, a newborn grandson just born last Wednesday, Simon Lee, weighed nine pounds. Just who cannot love a new baby? And yet Jesus tells me that if I love my grandson more than I love him, I'm not worthy of him. Two newlyweds in here, and yet if the spouse loves, the, if, if, if one of them love the other one more than they love Jesus, they are not worthy of Jesus. That's what Jesus said. I love my wife. There's no question about it. I'll be the, I'll be the first one to, 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 to push her out of her way, get hit by the truck, take the bullet, whatever. But if I love my wife more than I love Jesus, I am not worthy of him. Now that's what he said. So Paul, talking about the breastplate of righteousness in Thessalonians, he says, let us who are of the day, let's be sober. Don't let anything intoxicate you away from your love and your devotion of Jesus. Not your spouse, not a new grandbaby, not a new baby, not, not a hobby, nothing, nothing. 
He said, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. I say, Paul, you, you got it wrong, Paul. It's not the breastplate of faith and love. It's the breastplate of righteousness. But Paul knows what he's talking about. And Paul, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is defining what he wrote in Ephesians 6 to be the breastplate of righteousness. Remember, righteousness means right standing. When you ask Jesus Christ to be the Lord of your life, to come into your life, and he came and he forgave you of all of your sins, and he, he, he shed his precious blood, washed away and your sins and made you whole, made you a brand new creation, he robed you in his righteousness. You didn't ask for it. You didn't earn it. There was nothing, you, no amount of money you could buy it. It's just a simple fact that you humbled yourself and you said, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I ask you, Jesus, forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and be my Savior. And he did. And then he clothed you. He robed you in his righteousness. You didn't ask for it. You didn't earn It's just there. And all of a sudden, you are righteous with his righteousness. All of a sudden, you know I can go boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in my time of need. Why, Pastor? Because I'm not coming in with my own efforts. I'm not coming in in my own strength, in my own righteousness. No, I'm coming in clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. But Paul said, put on the breastplate of faith and love. Now that's synonymous for righteousness. And he breaks it down into two, two pieces. You see, faith is the righteousness of Christ that I got when I trusted Christ. Faith is that robe of righteousness that I got. Love is doing what is right out of my love for Jesus. Because righteousness not only means right standing, another ver uh, translation it's there where it says, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It says, right standing with God and moral excellence. Moral excellence. I want to live in a way that's pleasing to God. Why do I want to do that? Because his love is in me. Before his love was in me, I lived any way I wanted to, and so did you. We live for ourselves. But when we repented of our sins and we asked Jesus Christ to come into our life and he brought not only the forgiveness of sins but his life in us and he brought his love in us and the Bible says we were made a brand new creation and all of a sudden now my will is to please him. My will is not to please myself. Now the temptation to please myself is still there. How many know that? still there. Oh yeah, you can't live this life and not be tempted with this flesh. You can't live this life and not be tempted to start living again just for yourself. But you read your word, you read your Bible, and it tells you that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. God has so equipped you that when that temptation comes and when that urge comes to serve self, you, by the power of God, can say, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. The power of Christ is in me. The love of God is in me. The Holy Ghost is in me. I'm not going to do that. But if we do that, if we succumb to temptation and we sin, which happens, how many know that happens? What are we to do? Man, if your heart's right for Jesus, you're going to go right to him. You're going to feel horrible. You're going to go to Jesus. You're going to say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry. I've sinned. I ask you to forgive me. And thank God he's faithful to his word and he forgives. How many know that? Yes. Whoo. I hope this is a good word. Jesus said this in John chapter 8, verse 24. He said, my father has not left me alone because I do always those things that please him. Jesus said that. My father hasn't left me because I do always those things that please him. For, please go to 1 John. 1 John, in your Bibles. Go way, way, way back, right before Revelation. I see some people are shivering. Is it too cold in here? Who thinks it's too cold in here? All the skinny people put their hand up. Amen. And all us that wear our winter coat all year long say it's fine. But I will, uh, let me adjust it. 1 John chapter 3, are you there? Look at verse, and I'll have to get there myself. Look at verse 18. 1 John chapter 3, verse 18. 
The apostle said, my little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue. Don't just, don't, 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 don't snow me, show me. It's a great way of saying that, okay? Let us not love in, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And hereby we know, look at this. This is how we know we are of the truth. This is how we know I have the truth of Jesus Christ. This is how I know I'm not serving a false Messiah, a false Jesus, a false gospel. This is how I know that God's truth is in me. Now read this. This is for all of us. And shall assure our hearts before him. Because brother, if our heart condemn us, anybody have your heart condemn you? You know, you know to do something and you know not to do something, you know it's wrong, you're a Christian. So the love of God's in you. You want to serve Jesus, and that's your goal, man. I'm going to serve Jesus. And nobody in here is perfect. All of us have fallen in that quest, haven't we? But what do we do? We get right back up, we repent, Jesus, I'm coming after you. And so we're serving Jesus, and all of a sudden, we do something, and we know it's not right, the first thing that happens is your heart condemns you. Not the Holy Ghost, your very own reborn heart condemns you. And you're like, man, why does that happen? Because you love Jesus. If you can do wrong and your heart not condemn you, you don't love Jesus. If you can do wrong and, and there be no conviction, no, 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 your heart's not condemning you and there's no conviction in your spirit, you don't love Jesus. He said, if our heart condemn us, uh-oh, God's greater than our heart. And he knows all things. Now, what, this is what I want you to see. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we what? Confidence toward God. You see, I know that in Christ, I have the breastplate of righteousness. I know I'm righteous by the blood of Jesus. But I also know that God, throughout the New Testament, tells me to walk worthy of him. God tells me to walk in moral excellence. Why does he do that? Is it to be a killjoy? No, because he knows the confidence that that brings. Many Christians, they can't pray in faith because they haven't been living right. And when the crisis hits, they try to pray in faith. And the best they can do is put a thing on Facebook that says, please, I need a lot of people to pray for me because they know they're not right. They don't have the confidence to walk up before God and, and say, hey, this is your word and I need you right now. If your heart condemn you, God's greater in your heart, knoweth all things. But if your heart condemn you not, then have you confidence with God. And look at the next verse. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. Uh-oh, in the New Testament? Yes. In the New and we do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Two kinds of righteousness. One is freely given when I gave my life to Christ. And the other is right living. Right living. As a believer, I want to do that. If you're a believer, it's in you. You want to do that. You want to honor Jesus. You want to love Jesus. Last place, and then we're closing. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I wish it were Father's Day. I would use, a, I would use this analogy. I'm going to use it for mothers, though. Mother's Day. I heard a preacher once say, he and his wife, they were eating dinner and their three children were there. And their three children were like a couple of teenagers and one like, you know, 11 or something. And the man, the husband, he looks at his sons with the mother's agreement. And he looks at them and he said, sons, I want you to know, your mother and I love you very deeply. And there's not one thing you can do to cause us to love you any less. And of course, they're like, oh, yeah, you know. He said, however, how pleased we are with you is totally up to you. Did you get that? How pleased we are with you is totally, there's nothing you can do to make us love you any less. But how pleased we are with you 
is totally in your court. That's what Paul's talking about, 1 Thessalonians 4. And then we're going to close. If I have a pianist, please come up. Verse 1, he said, Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, we exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now look at that. The Apostle Paul preached this. Peter preached this. John preached this. Jude preached this. James preached Preach this. Jesus preached this. Here's how you ought to walk and to please God. I want to know that. I want to know that for me because I want to please. Look, I know God loves me as much as he's ever going to love me. I know I cannot earn his love. There's nothing I can do where God says, hey, because you did that, I love you just a little bit more. No, no way. Uh Uh-uh. There's nothing I can do to get God to love me anymore. I don't even try. I don't need to try. He's crazy about me. I'm his second favorite son. But I want to know how do I walk and please you, God? How do I, I know I can never repay you. But Lord, I want to honor you. So Jesus, thank you for your blood and your mercy and your grace and your love. Now, how can I walk and that's pleasing to you? That's what I want to know. That's what every true Christian wants to know. And it's not that, that we're paying a, something back. We can't, God doesn't expect it. I want to walk and honor him. Why? Because he loves me so much. I want to please my wife. Why? Because she loves me so much and I love her. Is this helping you? Is this making sense to you? So he says, how you ought to walk and to please God so you would abound more and more. He said, we've taught you this. He said, for you know, for you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. And I love this. So many people, and I've been saved over 40 years, so many people come to my wife and I, and they're like, Pastor, I'm trying to find the will of God for my life. And I know what they mean. They want to know, does God want me to be a missionary? Does God want me to work in the nursery? Amen. Does God want me to, you know, work with youth or, or with addicts or something? I know that's what they want. But I'll first, I'll ask them, I'll say, well, let me ask you this. I know there are at least five places in the New Testament where God's will is revealed in Scripture Are you living those out? Are you walking, are you obeying the will of God for what you can read? Because when you obey God's revealed will, then he will take you more into the will he has for your life, your personal life. Does that make sense? And there's at least five times in the New Testament where Paul says, this is the will of God for you. And this is one of those places. He said, for this is the will of God, and this is to every believer, even your sanctification. What is sanctification? It's a big word. Sanctification means to be set apart from the world and set apart for Jesus. You see, salvation is an event, being born again, followed by a process, sanctification. When you got born again, I guarantee you, God sanctified you. And all of a sudden, the things you used to like, you don't like anymore. And things that were of interest of you are not of interest to you anymore. And things you were a little wishy-washy about, now you're solidified in. And as you continue to gird your loins about with truth, and you continue to get to see Jesus in his word, your sanctification grows and grows and grows. Sanctification is something you'll deal with till the day you die. I mean, some of you just think, Think of, what, of how your life is now than it was five years ago. Some of you, you look back five years ago, you say, as a Christian, I can't, re- I can't even believe I watched that trash. I can't even believe I listened to that trash. I, I can't even believe I behaved that way. But why do you say that now? Because you're being sanctified. As you get closer to Jesus, 
Jesus said in his prayer in John 17, Father, sanctify my people with your truth. Your word is truth. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, are you having trouble cleansing your way? Is there a certain sin that seems like you can't get the victory of? It says, how will a young person cleanse their way? And he says, by taking heed according to the, the, my word. The psalmist went on to say, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You see, I, I can't walk pleasing with God of my own strength. But man, I can get full of his word. And all of a sudden here, come, okay, so here we go. He said this. This is the will of God, verse three, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from, what's the first word? Fornication. People go, my goodness. We had a lady uh, years ago, she was on a worship team. Her boyfriend moved in state. She let him move in with her. She found out that we found out. And so before we could talk to her, she quit the worship team and, and left church. And in writing to her private message, she wrote back to me once. She goes, Pastor Mike, why is it that every time you talk about sin, the first thing you talk about is sexual sin. I say, well, probably because 99% of the time when God talks about this, the first thing he talks about. Probably because fornicating is a little more pleasant than stealing a piece of bubble gum. Oh, y'all don't act like you're a bunch of angels out there. <laughs> probably because fornicating is a little more exciting than downloading something in, in, in you know, piracy. Oh, you guys act like angels. Okay. It says that you abstain from fornication. Now, some people say, oh, fornication. That's, that's not married people. No, the word fornication is the Greek word pornea. Pornea covers every sexual sin God can imagine. Because I know there's probably a few men haven't invented yet. It covers adultery, covers premarital sex, covers homosexuality, covers lesbians, covers bestiality, covers it all. When God says abstain from sexual immorality, from fornication, it's covering, there's only one, you know, God invented sex. This is Mother's Day. Can we talk about sex a little bit? You got here because of it. Every one of you. The evidence is in my favor. Larkin, everybody's here because of sex. There's only one type of sex God endorses and improves of, and that is sex between a man and a woman in holy matrimony. That's it. How many want to get married right now? I wouldn't blame you, neither does 1 Corinthians 7. Go read it. Amen. Okay, I'm getting off subject. He said that every one of you should know how to possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even though it was a big word, look it up in the Amplified, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we have forewarned you and testified, for God has not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despises this commandment despises not man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Paul said, this is the will of God, that you know how to walk worthy of him and to please him. That's what I want to do. And married people don't think that you're off the hook because there's sexual sin that married people do that God says is not right. But that ain't the subject matter. Subject matter is put on the breastplate of righteousness. Not just the, 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 the righteousness that God freely gives you, but the righteousness, the breastplate of right living, which simply means this, God, I want to live in such a way that honors you. I want to live in such a way that shows your love in me. That's what it means simply. It's not getting into legalism. It's not serving a tyrant. It's God, I want to honor you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. Please, every head bowed, every eye closed. Are you here this morning? And you say, Pastor, I, I need to recommit my life to Jesus. I've, I've slipped away. I, 
I know Jesus, but pastor, I've been slipping and I need to recommit. Or question two, pastor, I've never known him as my Lord and Savior. And today on Mother's Day, I want to give my life to Christ. So if that's you, if you say, pastor, I want prayer to recommit my life. Or pastor, I want prayer. I want to ask Jesus Christ into my life. I want to become a follower of Jesus. If that's you, please stand right where you're at. I'm not going to call you to the front. Just want you to stand right where you're at. We want to pray for you. If that's you, please stand right where you're at. We want to, Pastor, I need Jesus in my life. I'm going to wait five more seconds. Anybody, Pastor, I need Jesus. I want him in my life. All right, let's all stand. Lord Jesus, I pray first and foremost for the moms and the grandmas that are out there and the mothers-to-be. Lord Jesus, I pray your blessing on them. Jesus, I pray that you fill them afresh with the love of God. I pray you fill them afresh with the peace of God. And Lord, I pray for it, the rest of the body of Christ. Jesus, help us to honor you. Help us to walk in a way that's worthy. Help us, Lord. We don't want to be bitter. We don't want to have unforgiveness. Lord Jesus, we don't want to be involved in things that we know is not right and you say is not right. Lord, we want to honor you. In your name we pray. Amen. God bless you and happy Mother's Day.